All right. In the last video, we have learned three types of algorithm runtime notations, such as big O, big omega, and big heta. Now, in this video, we will look at some examples of algorithm runtime complexities. There are many time complexities exist in the world of algorithms. Here, we will look at the most commonly used complexities. Here is the list of complexities that we are going to discuss. The first one is O1, which is also called order of one or constant time complexity, which means that for any given input, the execution time will not change. It will remain constant. As an example, accessing a specific index within an array. It does not matter whether the array has 10 or 100 indices, looking up a specific location of the array will take the same amount of time. Therefore, the function has a constant time lookup. Here, as you see, when we access first element of the array, it will take constant time. It doesn't matter if there are 100 or 1000 elements in, inside the array. If you look at the real example, imagine that we have a deck of cards. And I ask you to remove the first any card at random. So you could simply grab a card from the deck without having to search through the entire deck. This is very easy task and takes constant time whatever card we grab. Because here we are selecting a random card and it doesn't matter which card we select, it takes always constant time. This is an example of constant time complexity. Now the next time complexity is linear time complexity, which is written as ON. Here, time complexity will grow in direction proportion to the size of input data. The best practice is to try to keep our function running below or within this range of time complexity. But obviously, it won't be always possible. A good example for linear time complexity is looping through the array elements. Here we have sample Python code, which loops through elements of the array. As you see, lookup time is directly related to size of our input. In our case, our input is array. If the size of array increases, then the loop time will increase proportionally. In other words, the larger the input, the greater amount of time it takes to perform this function. Of course, if the array only had one element, then the function would have constant time lookup. Now, if we go back to our deck of cards analogy, again, if we have a deck of cards and I want to select a specific card, let's say we want to select 10 hearts from this deck. In this case, you have to look through every card until you find the, that card. Sure, there is possibility that it will be the first card in the deck, but it's highly unlikely. Now think about if the deck of cards were filled with the hundreds of other cards, which are not 10 hearts, your search is directly related to how large deck of card is. If we have 100 cards here, we have to look one by one inside these cards and to find specific card. So which means that the more card we have here, the more time it will take to find out 10 hearts out of these cards. And this is an example of linear complexity. The third type complexity is order of log n, which is called logarithmic time complexity. This time complexity refers an algorithm that runs in a proportionally to the logarithm of the input size. Let's see the code here. In this function, we are logging numbers until the array length is passed. However, we can see that our function only logging the numbers at certain level. Since we will be repeating a constant time lookup multiple parts of the array, our function will not have constant time lookup. It should be noted that since our function does not pass through every index in the array, it will not have linear time. By using the range function of Python here, we start from the first element until we reach the length of the array. 
and each step we visit every third element, not all of them. So in the resource section of this lecture, I've included a file which shows how range function works in Python. So if you are interested, what is the parameters here, uh, you can have a look in that documentation. So to make things more clear, let's continue with our example of deck of cards. Again, using our deck of cards analogy, let's say our cards order and split it into two parts. In the first part, we have diamonds and clubs, and in the second part, we have hearts and spades. Now, if I ask you to pull out 10 hearts, you could safely conclude that card should be in the second part, here, over here. Furthermore, we know that card should be only within the heart, so which means that we will look at this part. Since we will be searching for 10 hearts, we can safely assume that the bottom half of the deck is irrelevant. This part is irre irrelevant to us. And we know that this list is ordered. And we can divide list into two parts and compare the number here with the number that we are looking. In our case, the number is 7. If we compare 7 with 10, we see that 10 is greater than 7, which means that we will look at the right part of this list. So from here, we can again continue to divide this part and we will compare 10 here. And we see that we find out the number that we are looking for. And you see that we find out the number that we are looking for. As you see, we didn't have to search through every card to find it. But it also was not easy as easy simply grabbing a random card. So we have searched, we have, we have searched not all elements, but some of them. So that's why this time complexity called logarithmic time complexity. Another example for this time complexity can be finding an element in a sorted array. Using binary search algorithms, we can achieve logarithmic time complexity. Because in the binary search algorithm, we are looking for x in n element sorted array. Let's see this example. In this example, we are searching for 9 inside this array. We are dividing this array into two parts and uh, the middle number is 11. We compare 11 to 9. We see that 9 is smaller than 11, which means that we will look this part. And again, we are searching for 9 within this uh, half array. Then here, we are again dividing this array into two, two, two parts. The middle point here is 8. So which means that we compare 9 to 8. We see that 9 is bigger than 8, which means that we will look at right side. On the right side, uh, there is left only one number. We are comparing this number with the 9. We see that it's equal to 9 and we return 9. As you see here, in each step, we are dividing our array into two and every time it's getting smaller and smaller. For example, if we start with 16 elements of uh, array, in each step it divides two, which will be 8, then 4, then 2, then 1. So the total time is a matter of how many steps we can take until we reach 1. So the question is how many times we can multiply 1 by 2 to get n. So the equation will be like this. Thus, where the number of elements in the problem space gets halved each time, that time complexity is logarithmic time complexity. So let's continue with the next time complexity, which is quadratic time complexity. Quadratic time complexity represents an algorithm whose performance directly proportional to the square size of input data set. It's like linear data structures, but here uh, the time is increasing quadratic. Within our programs, this complexity will occur whenever we nest over multiple iterations. Here again, we have a piece of Python code. This function is a great example of how easy it is to pass through an array twice using two loops. It's clear that in the first part, our function will be searching through the array at, the, at least once. And for each loop, from the first loop, 
we iterate same elements in the second loop. In doing so, we are passing over the same array twice with each search, producing a quadratic time complexity. Let's revisit our deck of cards again. Let's say you pick the first card in the deck, which is three club in our case. And we want to get all threes inside this deck. To get this, we need to revisit our deck again. So we will revisit the deck until we get the all threes from the deck. Once we are sure that we got all threes, we will continue to do it with the second number, which is seven heart. And this will continue until we reach end of the deck. And every time we go back to the deck, the time will increase quadratically. And this is an example of quadratic time. The next time complexity is exponential time complexity. Exponential time complexity denotes an algorithm whose growth doubles with each addition to the input set. If you know any other exponential growth patterns, this works in much the same way. The time complexity starts off very shallow, rising at an ever increasing rate until the end. Fibonacci numbers are the great way to express exponential time complexity. Although there is a way to make the Fibonacci function have a shorter time complexity, for this case, we will be using double recursive method to show how it has an exponential time complexity. Since the number of recursive calls is directly related to the input number, which is n in our case, it is easy to see that how this lookup time will quickly grow out of hand. If we have great number here, the time that we need will increase quickly. So now we have explained the most commonly used time complexities and it's normal that you might not understand some terms in, in this lecture. You don't need to worry about this because we will cover them in detail in upcoming lectures. So you might be interested that why we are including such concepts here. So the answer is without this concept, we cannot explain different types of time complexities. Okay, let's see how these time complexities are depicted in the graphic and which ones are good for faster and efficient programs. Here we have all these complexities on the graph. Here on the x-axis we have elements, which is the input numbers. And on the y-axis we have operations. As we mentioned before, the best practice time complexities are below ON, as you see here. Here you can see below ON, which is linear time complexity, we have green color. As you can see from the graph, it's good, and then it goes to excellent. In excellent position, we have constant time complexity, which shows that the time that is needed to perform operations does not depend on input elements. As our inputs increase, the time that we need to, to do operation does not change. So the constant time complexity is the best case for an algorithm. So the next complexity in the graph is all again logarithmic time complexity. Here again, we see that this time complexity is also desirable, which stays below ON. And from the graph, you can see that it's in green. Then above linear time complexity, we see that ON log N time complexity, which is bad according to this graphic. And as you can see from here on, we have very horrible cases as shown in the graph. As you can see in the red part of our graph, as input increases, the time that we need to execute any operation increases dramatically, which is very time consuming. And that's why in terms of big O, big o complexity, these cases are horrible. With this, we come to the end of this video. Hopefully you understood the different types of time complexity and you have an idea of which is desirable for an algorithm.